Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. For those of you that don't know church history, help out those of you that know the story here. After, after Paul wrote this letter, did they put that guy out of the church? Yes. What happened with that guy? Anyone know? You, can, you actually can know this by reading 2 Corinthians. He repented. It woke him up. It was like a wake-up call. Paul had to write 2 Corinthians to say, now that you put him out and he's repented, they were, they were so good at putting him out, they're like, we put him out, man. We're good. He says, yeah, but the guy's repented. He broke away his sin. Now what, what does he write in 2 Corinthians? Now go get him back and restore him. Job done. I mean, the whole idea is that he had, well, let, let me put it this way. He had a staph infection, spiritually speaking. And the problem with having that staph infection inside of the hospital. By the way, if you think church of church has um, a, a museum of the righteous, you should probably leave now. Because I, I learned a long time ago, that's not us. We're more like the, um, we're more like, a, 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 you, how many watched the show MASH with Klinger and Hawkeye and, you know, mo Mobile Army Surgical Hospital? We're the Mobile Army Spiritual Hospital. We are the MASH, here we are, see our tents, we pop them up, we tell people about the Lord. And he, how many of you have seen the show MASH? Do, do you guys remember how dysfunctional those individuals were? <laughs> That's kind of like our church. Yeah. Except that whenever Radar said incoming, and everybody, wasn't it amazing when they all knew it's time to save a life? They all came together. And I mean, it didn't matter. Klinger's in a dress doing weird stuff. He's still hauling in pans and helping them get ready. And they're prepping for surgery. And they're saved doing miraculous, heroic things to save people. Because the focus was, we got to take care of the perishing. They were able to set aside all the crazy differences and all the, the pettiness because it's time to do the job. We're here to get these people stable. We're here to save them. You know what, I believe that that's really what our church is more like. We're like the spiritual hospital that, that is mobile, and God says, I'll use you. But, you know, there's going to be some crash victims. There are going to be some people that are, you know, come from the front line and are really beat up and they're really hurting. And you're going to have to stabilize them. They're bleeding out. They're really in a bad way. And, you know, even with our dysfunction, the Lord seems to give us that vision of we need to help that people. That person, we need to get in there and help them. Triage, you know. And all of a sudden you just call and everyone jumps to the, let, let's see what we can do. And, and we help save souls. That's what we're in the business of doing. It's a beautiful thing. Except that, see, if, it, if you think of it in this, in this analogy of a hospital, a spiritual hospital, the church is there to help minister to those that are hurting. People are going to come in with problems. Just like they come into a hospital with problems. And if they come in with those problems, you know, the, the, the people who are part of the hospital staff are going to attend to the visitors, right? The ones coming in for, for, for whatever the problem is they need checked up. And that's what they're to do. But Paul is saying, hey, you know, amongst your staff, you've got one of, your, one of your guys, maybe he could be one of a Hawkeye or something, you know, or Pierce one of your surgeons, except that he's got this raging staph infection. And it's weeping out, and you're letting him go into surgery. There's a problem with that. He said, because if you leave him in the operating room, right, and he's got an open staph wound, wait, wait, okay, in a, just think of it, my, I guess because I'm around hospitals as a pastor, I already know the answer, but my wife was a med tech, I got to go around hospitals a lot. What's the answer to this? Do they let surgeons who have active, open staph infections go in and do surgeries? No. What do they do with them? They get them out of the hospital, stay away, get on antibiotics, get rid of the staph infection, get well, and then what? Then come back. 
They don't let them be in the hospital with that staph infection. Because that staph infection is very infectious. It's very contagious. And if we only understood what sin is like, how contagious is sin? How much can it, how much can it you know, ooze onto someone else and, and, and ruin their day? Now, I'm not talking about the people. He says, I'm not talking about people in the world. I'm talking about people in the church, on staff, at the hospital. He said, that's what he's talking about. I'm talking to you about a guy in your church. He's part of the staff of the church. He's part of the, the body there. And he's got an infection spiritually. And you guys, instead of telling him, go home and get rid of it, are just letting him hang out and do surgery with you. And it's, Paul saying, don't you know a little leaven, a, a little staph infection is going to spread to a lot more staph infection. You're going to create a whole epidemic. It's kind of like being stuck on a plane with those people that are coughing behind you. Anyone ever felt like, oh no, why do they always get seated? We were, our last flight, we had them like all, it's around sound, Jan said. It was like behind, in front, the side, the other side. And we're like, we're doomed. You're in a metal tube. The air is recirculating. We're going to die in here. You know? It is not what I want to be doing when you're going on vacation to be surrounded by sickies. You know? It's just... But when you go to church, to, to be there to help those that are not well come to the great physician, who is not us, by the way. It's Jesus. He's the great physician. We're just like the candy stripers and the, you know... The helpers, you know, we, but we try to help people come to him. And when we help them come to the Lord, the Lord is a great, I mean, he, you don't, there's a mash helicopter right on cue, incoming radars, incoming triage, everyone get ready. I had that arranged just for you. <laughs> no, you got to learn to go with the flow when you're on a beach in Hawaii. You guys get the idea, right? Paul wasn't uptight that he's saying, hey, you know, I judge this guy as if... Paul's like, that guy needs to wake up. He's got a raging staph infection. He doesn't even realize what it's doing to the rest of the people around him. And you know, spiritually, that happens in churches sometimes. We had a fellow many years ago in our church, and he was actually part of our worship team. I'm not going to tell you his name, but I will tell you what happened. He decided that, you know, he lived down south and he would drive all the way into church. And, it, you know, it was like 90 miles or so from his house to here. And so he would drive up and, you know, we tried to have worship practices sometimes the day before the service on Saturday. And um, so I wanted him to be there for worship practice. And he started going, yeah, but it, then I'd have to drive home and then drive back, and it's a long drive, and I'm going to understand. And so one morning he, he showed up at church real early, and I thought, man, you know, because it takes him a while to get, and he's an early bird, but still getting up, and it's an hour and a half, two-hour drive to get here, you know, and he's, wow, you're here early today. And he's like, yeah, I got to stay over um, someone's house here in town. Okay. And he didn't tell me who. But um, as time went on, he kept staying over at this person's house. He was always at practice, and, and it was always, you know, early. And, and pretty soon, I started noticing one of the other gals on my worship team wasn't looking so good. Turned out, that's where he was staying. And, uh, and it turned out that, you know, when you're the pastor and you have two worship team members that you can see their countenance has gone from really bright and excited about the Lord to oh Lord I thank you I really thank you you know you're like something's wrong so bef I just prayed about it the girl came right to me and says I can't take this anymore we're in sin and I don't know how to break it off and I don't know what to do but I know I'm supposed to I read the Bible and they put a they put the immoral people out of the church she read Corinthians and God convicted. You know, you don't even have to, when you got God on your side, pastoring's easy because his spirit convicts before you ever get a chance. So all I had to do is say, well, 
he, you better listen to that conviction because whenever God's spirit convicts you to, to do the right thing, please, by all means, do it because his spirit's looking out for you. So I told her, just tell him, don't, no more sleepovers. You cannot, you know, this is not right. You're not married. You're, you guys are not, this is, you can't play house and sorry. He'll get upset. I'll talk to him. So I went and talked to him. Now, I did the, what, you guys are probably familiar with the passage in Matthew, Matthew 18, where, where Matthew writes for us, if you see your brother in sin, what's the first thing you do? Let, let, we'll turn there real quick. Let me just show you for those, well, I'll end with this today. Matthew 18, I love these words. So, s such a great way to handle it when someone, because we all, we all get blinded by our sin. And Matthew 18, verse 15 says, if your brother sins, it says, go to him, it says, in what? In private, and show him his fault. And if he listens to you, well, then you won your brother. So I went to him in private and said, hey, brother, you know, I know that you're playing house, and you're not supposed to be, and you're on the worship team, and, um, you know, this, this is something you can break off. I mean, you still got your car. You can drive home. You just got to quit staying, doing sleepovers. Or you, you shouldn't marry the girl if you're really, you know, but you cannot keep doing what you're doing. Well, he didn't like what I had to say. He went and yelled at her about it, which you shouldn't do around me because big no-no. So I stood up. I, I literally had to, to rush in and stand between him as he was screaming at her. Because you're not supposed to tell anyone this is our secret. And you know, it's interesting when people are in sin how they want it to be a secret. Except the, the thing is, when you have staff and it's weeping all over, it's no secret. To the other people around you, they see the oozing goo and they're like, something wrong here. And, you know, spiritually, the longer you're in the Lord, you, you, you love the Lord, you, you, you start to see that oozing in different, you know, you, you've recognized, oh, that's that infection. Oh, that's what comes when they slept together before they're married. Or, or that's, that's the infection of somebody here is lying. That's deceit. They're not telling the truth. Or that's the infection of, you know, and you start noticing these things. Paul just talked about the different leavens that leaven the cake and, uh, the, or the lump of dough. He says, you, you see it. I just stepped right in front of him and said, stop it. You need to back off. And you're, you're in sin, and your sin has blinded you so much that you're yelling at her or something that you, didn't, you didn't need to man up. You're the one that needs to break off your sin. Well, he didn't like it, but he really liked my father. This is when my, my dad, Frank, was alive, and he, he respected my dad, so I went to my dad, and my dad was already aware. He saw the same oozing going on. He saw what was happening to that dam. And my dad was on the worship team, too. Played his accordion with me. And so my dad, I said, Dad, you know, it says here in Matthew 18, let me read you the next verse. It says, if he does not listen to you, verse 16, Matthew 18, 16, then take one or two more with you. So that out of the, it says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. So if he won't listen to you just on your own, you try to win him privately. That's, by the way, that's always the first step. You go to them privately. If they don't want to listen, this is something I'm going to tell you just to refine this. It says to take along someone else. I suggest if you really want the most effective chances of winning them over, take along someone else who you know cares about the person. Don't take along someone who doesn't give a rip. It doesn't work as good. Take along someone who really genuinely has a, a love for that person. That way when you come with that, you know, like when I brought my dad with me to talk to him, he knew that I loved him enough to talk to him in private. Now I'm bringing my dad, who he knows loves him. And we're just s talking man to man. This is a real issue. And this is a thing. You're in the church. You're on staff at the hospital, spiritually. And you've got an infection. And you need to, you need to get rid of it. You need to clean up your act. Because this is not going to reflect good on the church when they find out, yeah, there's a guy on the worship team who's betting one of the girls on the worship team, and, and they're all up there in front saying, praise the Lord. Right? That's going to just, do you think the world would have a heyday with that? Yeah. Hypocrites in the church. Of course they would. 
This is where Paul would step in and say, I have already judged him as if I was there. Paul was not afraid to call sin, sin. This world has gotten so weird. They go, you're not supposed to call my sin that. You're not politically correct. Why is it sin? I mean, as last time I checked, sin is still sin. Call it what it is. Because until you acknowledge your sin, the Bible says, you can't get forgiven for it. You have to confess your sin to receive forgiveness. But if you confess, 1 John 1, 9 says, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and, what was that next part? And what does he do? He cleanses you of all staff infections. No, all unrighteousness, which is a spiritual staff infection. He will clean you up if you confess it. But if you say, this ain't sin, I ain't sinning, which <laughs> this is a really hard testimony to share with you because the guy we talked to, my dad and I, very lovingly went to him. He told me, he said, I'm not going to quit doing this. And I know, <laughs> this is what just stabs me to the heart. How many of you guys know verse 17 of Matthew? Matthew 18. If he refuses to listen to you, when you bring two or more witnesses to confirm it, then it says, then tell it to the church. And if he refuses even to listen to the church, then let him be as a what? As a heathen or a tax collector. I don't know about how many of you want to hang out with a tax collector, but back then it wasn't like a... You know what's really on? You guys are going to crack up. Look at what gospel we're reading from. Matthew. Tell me why is that so ironic? Because before he followed the Lord, he was a tax collector. And if you happen to have um, a Bible like mine, it's kind of cool. In the, in the Gospels of my Bible, I have this feature. It says, words of Christ in red. Okay, they're, you know, when it's Jesus talking, they put it in red ink. Now, I'm colorblind, but I still can spot the difference in the light between the black and the red ink because the red's a little lighter to my eye. And I'm pretty sure, can you help me out? Is this red right here? Right. Yep. Highlighted in yellow. Highlighted in yellow. I use highlighters. They still work. Even to colorblind people, we still see that there's something smeared all over. <laughs> we know right there, those words of Jesus. See, right there? And that's the words of who? Who said this? He said, Jesus is the one who said this thing about go to him in private. And then if he won't listen, bring someone. And if he doesn't listen to you when you bring someone, then take him before the church. If he doesn't listen to the whole church, this is Jesus' words. Do you think Jesus knows how to handle someone in sin? In the church. The head of the church gives these instructions. I'm pretty sure I can go with this. And then if he refuses, then let him be to you as a Gentile or as a tax collector. And ironically, <laughs> who wrote it down for us? The disciple who was the tax collector before he followed the Lord. Just to put that little punctuation point in there. You know, he put it in. Let him be as a tax collector to you. That means you don't hang out. This brother I'm telling you about, before I could, you know, he's already saying, I am not going to stop doing this. And I'm like, well, then I'm going to, you know, the next thing is I'm going to have to take you before the church. And uh, I didn't even start, I, I began to like, well then, and he goes, before you say another word, you're going to say, you're going to take me before the church, and before you even get a chance, I'm out of here. You don't even get to kick me out. I'm leaving. It broke my heart because, you know, I, I wanted the guy to, to be redeemed. I mean, the whole idea of when you see your brother in sin is to help him get out of it. Not to help get him out of the church. That's not, that's not my goal as a pastor. Get rid of the, the, the sinners. It's get rid of the sin. Keep the sinners, right? The Bible teaches us you hate the sin, but you love the sinner. That's what it's taught in Jude. Read the, it's only one page. One, I mean, it's not one chapter. You read, you read the letter of Jude, and it, it literally teaches us to despise the garment polluted by sin. 
but don't hate the sinner. I mean, these, these very garments we have that cloak our spirits, these bodies, man, they mess up. And Jude says, you can hate the sinner, but you can't hate the sinner. You've got to love the person. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to love people out of those things. We're here to help them. And the ones that are part of our body, part of the staff, if they should happen to be on staff at the church, and when I say on staff, I mean if you're just part of the regular attending group here, you're part of, the, of, of, of this body of believers. And if you're found in sin, I mean, if I was, I would want you to come to me in private and say, hey, pastor, you're blowing it. You know, and then if I wouldn't listen, get some other people. You know, some guys are pig-headed. But I can tell you another testimony where I did this very same thing. And before I had to go get a second witness, guess what? The person repented. They went, oh, man, I really needed to hear that from someone else because I, I, I had this uneasiness inside and I, I was really wrestling. Like, is this me thinking this or is this God telling me to stop it? And you just confirmed it, that I'm supposed to stop that. And, and what they were doing was really immoral. But they came out of a really, really immoral background where everyone was doing that. And so this is a whole new revelation. This is like revelation of the light, you know? <laughs> wow, I don't think Jesus wants me to do this anymore, even though my grandfather did it, my father did it, and, you know, everyone I know does it. And yet, you know, they... I was like, brother, you really ought not do that. And he's like, oh, yeah, that's right. And it freed him. It was so cool. It was like, it's, a, it's the greatest feeling when you help somebody. It says, if you tell your brother and he hears you, he listens, you won your brother. And there's a sweetness that happens when you do that because you're actually helping someone get through a problem. You know, you're helping them get over a hurdle. There's nothing sweeter than having people that you know care enough about you to help you get through the hurdles of life. But see, the world is going to tell you what I'm teaching you today is too personal. You can't touch on those things because, hey, you're going to be cramping my personal space. If you got a staph infection, you're cramping my personal space. I'm just saying, if you've got a spiritual staph infection, you just, look, I feel like I'm in a tube right now with you anyway, even though we're outdoors. It's like being in the airplane analogy, you know? I don't want you coughing on the back of my head. I don't want you with some spiritual sickness going, it's okay. <coughs> I'm like, get on some antibiotics and get rid of that thing, okay? If you've got spiritual sin in your life, little leaven, get rid of it. You're not doing anyone else in the body of Christ a favor. And the worst thing is, you don't even realize that you're the one that's going to be suffering the most. Paul is like looking at this guy who's taking his father's wife to bed and going, you guys have you're not even mourning. Don't you see that th th this sin is like, it's going to bring death. I mean, what's it going to do to dad and the dad? And the, the mom's, I mean, what... This is going to implode. I mean, you've seen a soap opera, right? You know that, that this is how it ends. That's, they, they rewrite the script. They just keep changing the names. But they stole a lot of the storyline from this book. You don't think there's some soap opera material in here? You ought to read Genesis. I mean, is there stuff in here that happens? You go, what? This guy went with who? And laid with whom? And, and, and another one? And You know, when people go... You're telling a story. In the Bible, there was actually people doing that? Yeah. Even in a church at Corinth. So could it happen in our church? Yes. But if it does happen, I hope that enough of you would have enough love for the other person to go to them in private first and talk to them. And if they won't listen, get someone else who loves them and go with them. You go together and talk to them. And you know, there's only been that one time that that fellow left. Before I could go to the church, he's, I'm out of here. But all of the other times when I've done this, go to them in private, and then if they didn't listen, bring someone else, I've never had to get to the third step where you get to, let's talk, tell the whole church. I've never had to do it. 
That guy preempted my first time. <laughs> but it's sad to my heart because I would have rather have done it and had him repent than what happened to him and what it did, you know, the, the damage that it did for his life spiritually. It did not grow him closer to Jesus. Now, she got redeemed, by the way. Just so you know, one good part about the story is she just went, oh, thank you, Pastor. Like, you, you know, I, I got to be like knight in shining armor for a day, you know, like, back away, buddy. Leave her alone. And it freed her. That was cool. That was worth it. But see, we're here to help people. And sometimes when they are bleeding out or they are sick, if you just think of it in the analogy of that hospital analogy, we are here as, we're here as, a mobile army spiritual hospital to help people. We're not a museum for the righteous. You're going to have to find another church if that's what you want because, I mean, look around. Pretty sure we got the whole MASH collection of, we could probably restaff this story and make a really cool movie out of it. Just with what we got going right. We got a dotty. <laughs> Come on, star material right here, you know. We got the good ones, my wife. We can make the whole story. I'm gonna kill yeah. you. She's going to kill me afterwards. I'm done. We better pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time in your word. Thank you for the sweetness, Lord, that your word has to encourage our faith. And I pray... Even as w w we began this study today with learning that we need active, growing faith, that we add your, your moral excellence to, your goodness, your, your knowledge and self-control. Lord, help us add all these qualities to our lives. Help them continue to increase in us, Lord, that we could be more and more useful for your kingdom's sake. And Lord, where we're blind or sin has crept in and deceived us, Lord, open our eyes. If you have to use our brothers or sisters to do that, or you just, your Holy Ghost, may your Holy Ghost just speak even to our hearts right now the areas that we need to, to come out of those dark shadows and bring them into the light, your light, that we could be truly freed from those things and healed, healed down into the depth of our soul. Lord, cleanse us now by the power of your washing of your Son's blood. Just wash us all clean for this upcoming week. I pray that now in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me listening to a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord to face this upcoming week? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.